Hello, I'm Carl Grossman. Here in New York City, in the, the building over there, the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan, there's been an absolutely super important conference today on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, nuclear power in general, and also the implications of the Fukushima disaster for nuclear power in the United States. The panelists, articulate, couldn't be more articulate, included the former Prime Minister, Naito Khan of Japan, who was the Prime Minister during the, well, the beginnings, it's still going on, the beginnings of the Fukushima disaster. Peter Bradford, who was a, he was a member of the NRC, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Ralph Nader, the, the legendary consumer activist. Arne Gunderson, a nuclear engineer and an executive of a, a major company in the nuclear industry who has now become a leading critic of nuclear technology. Now, this is after years, decades in the nuclear industry. Our next speaker uh, is going to help us continue the process of getting to a deeper understanding of the accident at Fukushima and its implications for us here in New York. And that would be Arne Gunderson, Chief Engineer of Fairwinds Associates. Arne Gunderson is Chief Engineer, again, of Fairwinds Associates, an energy consulting firm. Arne Gunderson has more than 40 years of nuclear power engineering experience. He attended uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, where he earned his bachelor degree cum laude while also becoming the recipient of a prestigious Atomic Energy Commission Fellowship for his master's degree in nuclear engineering. Arnie holds a nuclear safety patent, uh, was licensed as a reactor operator, and is a former nuclear industry senior vice president. During his nuclear power industry career, Arnie also managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants in the United States. Please welcome Arne Gunderson. Thank you. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank the, uh, the Samuel Lawrence Foundation uh, for being the nucleus of uh, creating this forum. And, and uh, just like a nucleus has other parts to it, um, there are numerous groups that also should be thanked, and I don't have the time to, but certainly Clearwater and Riverkeeper are, uh, are at the top of that list. I'd also like to thank uh, um, hundreds of people who, uh, uh, at, at, at the Fukushima Daiichi site who dedicated their lives to preventing that accident from becoming worse. Um, I hope that someday there'll be a, a memorial to the, the hundreds of people who stayed behind and save Japan and reduce contamination in the Northern Hemisphere. You know, today's, we wouldn't be here today. This gathering would not be necessary if federal and state policymakers and business interests within the nuclear industry, but also within New York State, really believed that the accident of Fukushima Daiichi happened. If you, if you watch the television, you come to the conclusion that nuclear accidents can happen, that nuclear accidents are inevitable. But our policymakers seem to think that it can happen somewhere else, but not in America. As I like to say, sooner or later in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proof. Well, Indian Point presents an interesting dichotomy. Uh, the NRC says that the chance of a nuclear accident is about one in a million. Um, with 40, uh, 400 operating nuclear reactors, if you put a million in the numerator and 400 in the denominator, you wound up with an accident about every 2,500 years. So from the time the Acropolis was built until now, there would be one nuclear accident using those numbers. Uh, the, the NRC uses a, a technique called probabilistic risk assessment to come up with that number, PRA. I like to refer to it as prey. Um, an old plant like, like Indian Point 
um, interestingly, uses data from younger plants to determine whether moving forward or not it will be safe. That's sort of like my doctor telling me that uh, you know I'll live to uh, 120 because he's basing his analysis on 25-year-olds. The um, um, but if we use the NRC's methodology, the chance of three meltdowns are one in the million times one in the million times one in the million. Uh, there's a lot of zeros there, 18 zeros is the chance of three, but yet it happened. And I think that's what happened, that the lesson of real life disagrees with the, uh, the lessons of, uh, uh, of the PRA. If you look at the last 35 years, we've had five meltdowns. We've had Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and three meltdowns of Fukushima. So if you put 35 in the numerator and five in the denominator, you come up with an accident about every seven years. Well, clearly, that's a lot different than once in every 2,500 years. My apologies, by the way, wind scale in Santa Susana and about a dozen other meltdowns that occurred before Three Mile Island in that analysis. Um, so, Policymakers and business interests ignore history and focus on the probabilistic risk assessment as they make the decisions to relicense Indian Point moving forward. While demanding taxpayer dollars to pay for accident insurance, those same policymakers, whether they're politicians, regulators, or members of the business community, seem to really believe in their heart of hearts that a nuclear accident can't happen at Indian Point. Now, when someone's brain reasons a way to justify support for something you want to be true, psychologists call that motivated reasoning. Now, there's a lot of motivated reasoning at the NRC and at policymakers here in New York State about why Indian Point should be allowed to move forward. Recently, I testified up in Canada at, a, uh, at the hearing of uh, the Canadian uh, Nuclear Safety Commission uh, on the Pickering nuclear reactors. They're, um, they're old, they were scheduled to be shut down, and they were asking for a license extension. Pickering has, has eight nuclear reactors 20 miles from downtown Toronto. At the hearings, speaker after speaker implored the CNSB to keep these aged nuclear plants running because they paid their taxes, and because they were a major employer. I heard speaker after speaker say that the people who worked at these plants were great people. They were on the school board, they coached the soccer team, they sang in the church choir. The logic seemed to be that if you have nice people running your plant, it will be safe. <laughs> the situation reminds me a little bit of Garrison Keillor, and Lake Wobegon, where he says all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Every town I visit that, owns a, that has a nuclear power plant, Adam, believes that their nuclear plant is better than average. Well, if history has taught us anything, it's that nuclear accidents happen despite the best intentions of the men and women who work at them. I knew the operators at Three Mile Island. I had people working for me uh, during the recovery efforts on the, on the plant site. Those operators were safety conscious as anyone. They lived in the community. Their homes were just down the street. And yet an accident happened. This is a technology that can have 40 good years to be wiped out by one bad day. After the Chernobyl accident, I got to know some of the operators at Chernobyl. They were brilliant engineers. And they were very safety conscious. They and their families lived right near the reactors. And yet an accident happened. This is a technology that can have 40 good years and one bad day. Then after I wrote my book, Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth in the Future, I uh, got to know some of the operators at, uh, at Fukushima. And again, their families lived right down the street. They were conscientious, they were safety, safety conscious. They knew how their plant worked like, like a book. They understood it completely. And yet the accident happened, 40 good years and one very bad day. <coughs> well, policymakers seem to be take, taking the front part of that sentence, 40 good years, to heart. 
but they're not taking the back part of that sentence, the one bad day part to heart. Companies like Energy claim their plants are safe. What exactly does that mean? Well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in congressional hearings admitted that it reviews about 5% of the material and the analysis that goes into a nuclear power plant. And they check off the boxes that that paperwork is actually existent. But what Energy doesn't tell you is that the commissioners at the NRC are vetted by the industry's lobbying group called NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute, before Congress is allowed to vote on them. And this same lobbying group works with the NRC Commission and the staff as they write the regulations that a nuclear plant is designed to work under. So what that means is that safe, someone like Energy in Indian Point, means that Indian Point can comply with the minimum acceptable standard established by a compliant regulator. Well, let's talk about a couple of specific items here. Um, about the corporations that own these plants. Um, the first is the, uh, the NRC, about 15 years ago, allowed nuclear plants to become limited liability corporations. Now, what that means is that a limited liability corporation is separate from the entity to which it reports. So we always talk about energy owning Indian Point or Vermont Yankee or Pilgrim. Each of those plants is its own limited liability corporation. Well, what does that mean? That means that if Indian Point 2, which is a separate limited liability corporation from Indian Point 3, if Indian Point 2 had an accident and released radiation, it could be declared bankrupt, and Indian Point 3 would not be on the hook for that liability. Now, Entergy wouldn't do that, would they? <laughs> You need only to look at Entergy's behavior after Katrina to see that they have, in fact, already behaved that way. After Katrina, while the city was bailing itself out, Entergy New Orleans, the, the power company that provides power to New Orleans, is a limited liability corporation. It declared bankruptcy. The corporation was making billions, but the entity that controlled New Orleans declared bankruptcy. And what happened then was that the United States government moved cash that was destined for poor, uh, poor families within um, New Orleans through the Community Development Block Grant Program and transferred it over to Entergy. And Entergy gave its executives bonuses. So what are the conditions like inside these old 40-year-old plants up the Hudson River? Two panels, one was sponsored by Entergy itself. In 2008, Entergy brought in 12 experts from around the world, handpicked, they're experts. And, and here's what they had to say about the condition of Indian Point. Quote, the physical condition of the plant is visibly deficient. The care and maintenance of some of the plant systems and structures do not meet the standards of high performing plants. It is the panel's view that the maintenance and preservation of non-critical plant systems, equipment and structures is important because it communicates to employees and to the public alike the owner and operator's commitment to professionalism. That's their own group said that, 2008. Well, Peter and I were on a panel in Vermont, and in 2010, we came to a very similar conclusion on Vermont Yankee. Here's what we said. The issue of inadequate application of resources, when you're on a panel that, that you have to use fancy language, that means that they're not spending enough money. The issue of inadequate application of resources takes on heightened importance as Entergy's status as an aging plant. Over the remainder of Entergy's operating life, the possibility of a shutdown within a few years can never be ruled out and will become a near certainty at some point. If the events of the last couple of years are any guide, Entergy has a tendency to focus expenditure on safety systems and systems obvious, of obvious reliability importance while withholding resources from systems it deems secondary to reliability. Quote, limited resource allocation for non-safety systems might be systemic within Entergy. What did Entergy do two months ago? 
they cut their staff by 5%. So in spite of two panels telling Entergy that they're not spending enough money, Entergy's reaction is to cut its staff by another 5%. Well, you might ask, what's the NRC doing about that? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Neil Sheehan, the public relations person at Entergy said, and here's his quote, the NRC has the ability to determine whether there are any adverse impacts through our reactor oversight process. If we observe any negative trends via inspection findings or performance indicators, we could determine if there's any linkage to human resource changes. Well, to me, what that means is that after an accident in Indian Point, they could go in and ultimately determine that they didn't have a big enough staff, but only after the accident. It's a matter that's systemic through the nuclear industry right now. Uh, because of declining prices, the um, reaction in, to make a profit is to cut your staff. It happened at Millstone, just over in Connecticut, where the operator of that plant said that its staff was higher than industry standards at the two-unit site. They had more people than the average two-unit site. So the NRC allowed them to reduce their staff. Well, think about that. An average, if you're higher than average and the NRC lets you come down to average, if you're lower than average, you would think the NRC would force you up. It didn't happen. It's a one-way ratchet. It only pushes staffs down and down and down. So as power plants are getting older, the staffs are getting smaller. It's a major concern. Well, every day at Fairwinds, uh, we, get, we get emails saying it can't possibly be that the American plants are as bad as the uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And I thought I'd look briefly at the condition of Indian Point and compare it to Daiichi. And in many ways, Indian Point is actually worse than Fukushima Daiichi was the day before the accident. The first issue, as was alluded to already, is emergency planning with a population center as close as New York City is to Indian Point. You know, Tokyo was uh, 120 miles away from Fukushima Daiichi. Indian Point is 26 miles up the road. Also, the Japanese were the best at emergency planning in the world. They really took emergency planning seriously. And yet the entire emergency planning system collapsed in the, in the, as a consequence of a severe accident where all the safety systems collapsed. If the Japanese couldn't do emergency planning right, I don't think anybody in the world can. The, the second thing is the condition of the spent fuel pool. Indian Point has five times more nuclear fuel in its spent fuel pool than does Daiichi. Indian Point has the equivalent of every bomb that was ever fired above ground in the above ground testing phases. That much radiation is in the pools at Indian Point and is not being moved to dry cask storage. The Japanese moved a lot of fuel to dry cask storage. The Japanese had about seven years of nuclear fuel in Daiichi, whereas Indian Point has over 30. The, the third thing is the... Um, is we all know that the common uh, view of the accident is that um, the Daiichi's accident was caused by an earthquake followed by a tsunami. But really what happened was this. The earthquake knocked down the power lines that fed the plant. And so that's called the loss of offsite power. Then the tsunami came in and wiped out the cooling pumps along the water. It also wiped out the diesels. But even if the diesels had not been wiped out, the cooling pumps along the water were. That's called the loss of the ultimate heat sink, because you need that water to cool your diesels. So that creates something that Chairman Yasko talked about, was this station blackout. And a nuclear plant is designed to withstand that for about four to eight hours. Now, can that happen at Indian Point? The answer is yes. Two people dedicated to dying as terrorists, could cause a loss of offsite power by shooting the, the transmission lines and also drive a, a high-powered boat with explosives into the intake structure, which would cause a loss of the ultimate heat sink. Two terrorists 
could create the same problem that we experienced at Fukushima Daiichi. I wrote about this two years ago in my book, but other people have been talking about this for years, and the NRC has done nothing to prevent the accident from getting any worse. Lastly on my list is earthquake frequency. You know, we always think of earthquakes as happening on the West Coast, but Indian Point has the worst um, core damage frequency. It's a, it's, a, it's a number designed to show how likely it is that the nuclear reactor core will be damaged in the event of an earthquake of any power plant in the country. And on top of that, the accident, the earthquake at North Anna shows us that earthquakes are a lot more likely to happen than we've ever anticipated. North Anna down in Virginia was uh, a Richter 6. And North Anna was designed to withstand a Richter 6. But everybody thought that Richter 6 would occur about once every thousand years. It happened in 30 years, which tells me that the probability of something bigger needs to be evaluated, that the plants need to be stronger. And oh, by the way, Indian Point is a mile away from an earthquake fault that hadn't been identified in the 60s and could cause an earthquake that its systems would not be capable of withstanding. Well, let me sum this up. It's easy for the nuclear industry to, um, to allow arrogance and hubris to set in when you look at the sheer size of a nuclear power plant. Um, Paul mentioned I went to RPI up in Troy, New York, and graduated in 72 while Indian Point was being built. And the nuclear department at RPI used to drive down to Indian Point, and we watched Indian Point being built. The, um, uh, both then and now, it's an impressive building. But nobody ever asked, why does it have to be impressive? What's inside those plants that requires such, a first, such an impressive structure in the first place? Well, Daiichi, the accident of Fukushima Daiichi, has shown us that nuclear power systems can fail with catastrophic results. And we need to ask, should we build using such an uncontrollable and unmanageable technology? The forces in these plants are enormous. And they must always be controlled 24-7, 365. Well, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima Daiichi have shown just how impossible it is to control an accident, to control a reaction 24-7, 365. One operator error, one significant weather event, one earthquake, or one terrorist attack, and all of New York City will face that one bad day. And like Japan, it will be one sad day. Thank you. Arnie Gunderson, thank you. Uh, in an attempt to be a full service moderator, I'm going to provide some footnotes for you. Uh, reports prepared not by uh, Riverkeeper or any other advocacy organization, but groups like uh, the National Academy of Sciences in 2006, finding a significant risk of terrorism associated with nuclear plants, including Indian Point, especially with regard to spent fuel. A report commissioned by Governor Pataki, performed by James Lee Witt, a former head of FEMA in 2002, indicating issues with Indian Point's evacuation planning. A study in 2013 by the Government Accountability Office indicating that all of our plants have underestimated the risk of evacuations beyond the 10-mile zone. Back in 2010, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did the math on the risk of meltdown uh, in reactors in the United States and found that the greatest risk of meltdown due to earthquake was at one of the two Indian Point reactors. 2013, again, the University of Texas, doing a study commissioned by the Defense Department, finding inadequate preparations for terrorism at all of our nuclear plants, and especially at plants like Indian Point with river access. Since Arne Gunderson spoke at the symposium, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster continues. It's a catastrophe never-ending. On part five of 
Fukushima Lessons for the World, Peter Bradford, a former commissioner of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Back closer to the time that Indian Point One um, opened, uh, I was actually a Nader's Raider uh, in the <laughs> summer of 1968. It was my first job out of law school. Well, job, if, uh, if you take job to mean paid, then actually <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, uh, the insights that I garnered from Ralph on, on that occasion with regard to the workings of the regulatory process have stood me in very good stead ever since. And this is my first chance to acknowledge that publicly in his presence, and I wanted to do so. Now, is it true, Mr. Bradford, that at one time you worked for Ralph Nader? Uh, <laughs> in a tone that suggests that they've discovered a close tie between me and Karl Marx. Um, and uh, because in a deep position, they can't really control how you meander about in your answer, um, I've developed a, a response that goes somewhat as follows. If, yes, uh, we were an interesting group. Um, it was Ed Cox who married Tricia Nixon and is now the New York State Republican chair. Um, <laughs> Will Taft, who was the Under Secretary of Defense in the Reagan administration and the legal advisor to Colin Powell and George W. Bush's administration. Judy Arene, who was the dean of the law, Georgetown Law School, uh, and a couple of other law professors. So no wonder you're one of the 100 most influential uh, people, you've been subversively training the establishment for <laughs> several decades now, and, and nobody's really noticed it. Yeah. The Fukushima Daiichi disaster, a catastrophe which is never ending, and the radioactivity which still is streaming out of the facility spreads in, in various ways. For example, every bluefin tuna that was, this is in 2013, that was caught, sampled, off San Diego was found to have cesium-137 from Fukushima. Bluefin tuna are a migratory fish that move between Japan and the west coast of North America. Fukushima, its meaning to the world, nuclear power is toxic, it's poisonous, it has not just the potential, but the probability of catastrophe, and it must be stopped. Every nuclear power plant in the world must be closed, and we must move towards safe, clean, renewable energy, energy which we can live with.